Let me first just fill you in on that phrase, it'll be all right on the night. It's not as you may think, anything to do with the Family Planning Association. <laughs> the expression originally came from the theatre, but nowadays it's been largely taken over by movie and television people, and they use it as a kind of incantation, a ritual chant to be employed at those moments during filming when, for one reason or another, someone makes a mistake that completely cocks up a whole scene. <laughs> Ran in two squadrons of bombers, Heinkel 111s. Detective cover one squadron and Messerschmitt 110s. The time we intercepted them, we were at the limit of our range. Jerry, of course, planning the raid and figured on that. With the result that we just couldn't hang on long enough. I think we got two 110s. I'm not sure, but they were probably. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> <Very funny>. Got it! <laughs> now, obviously, such moments of chaos uh, are, are never used for the version that the pu public eventually sees. So. Where those aborted scenes generally get buried is in the cutting room, in a pile of cans marked NG takes. NG standing for no good, the uh, film business being nothing if not terse. But <laughs> why I, I carefully inserted the word generally is because what we've been going about doing is digging them up again. And it's around some of the choicer of these NG takes we found that this program has been nailed together. So, what are the most common reasons why some bits of film never make it to the screen? Well, if you ask an actor, there's no doubt what his answer will be. Dries, fluffs, blow-ups and corpsing. <laughs> Which serves you right for talking to actors. <laughs> if you want those trade descriptions translated, well, a dry is more or less what it implies, a, a drying up. A, a desertion of memory, a sudden mental cry of, what's my line? <laughs> All right, and action. Now let's, what, what is it? <laughs> what is it? Sick and tired of people like you coming into my surgery complaining about things that you have brought on yourself. If only you would eat sensibly. I mean, quite honestly, now listen to me. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. People... <laughs> Everything seems to be going wrong for us. Yeah, I know. Adam's jumping the traces. Well, it certainly is a funny thing. I can't remember a goddamn word. <laughs> as soon as you started being nice to Michelle, she went back to Haywood and June's. Mind you. Oh, God, I don't know what I say next. <laughs> of course I. Of your little <laughs> presence of mine lines before I came. <laughs> you didn't intend to fire us, did you? No, I didn't. And I certainly wish I knew my next line. <laughs> hey, didn't I see you on the box advertising Brute 33? Yeah, that's right. Jesus Christ, I've forgotten my lines. <laughs> Tonight, my guests include John Peters, Barbara Streisand's hairdresser turned film producer, who's said to have tamed that fiery chanteuse, as they say in America. Dennis Weaver, one time door to door purveyor of silk hosiery, but better known to us as Marshal Sam McLeod, will sing and talk to us, and so will Amy Crosley, a 95 year old, sometime fascist and airport lavatory attendant, who had just the one singing lesson from Caruso's widow. There'll be more stylish music from the Jacques Lucier trio, so please join in us and join our... Hello, Mr. Peters. Hello, Mr. In other words, if, if we can paraphrase that Bo Diddley song, don't let your mind write no checks, your mouth can't cash. <laughs> but in that, in that very last example, did you notice that what Burt Reynolds stubbed his tongue on was the name of the character he was playing? Because names very frequently are the trap. And if you need any further proof, watch this. what I'm here for, don't you? Uh. I'm covering the war games. Oh? 
You know, Henry could be very useful to me for contacts at headquarters in the embassy. Henry? And the post? <laughs> well, Diane, Henry. That's my name. Her name's Julia. I'll take four. Action! Are you ready? Nothing beats a great smell of fruit. Tell you something. What's that? I use it too. Everyone loves a winner, aren't David? <laughs> I'll be back in the I couldn't sleep. I am sorry, sir. Just when we had such an important day. Mr. Jason will be here any minute, sir. It's all wrong, Fritz. It's all wrong. The chocolate, sir? No, no. This, this is this business with Jason and Elena. Elena, my uh... <laughs> <laughs> In berth three of the busy port of Belfast lies the 800-ton Moray Fourth, the first. <laughs> 452, take nine. Huh? Yes, we live, of course. Uh, a dead corpse in a bath uh, can make uh, quite a difference. And I know that this person will lead me on the trail of the sign. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, his name. <laughs> <laughs> nothing beats the smell of fruit. Tell you something. What's that? I use it too. Everyone loves a winner, aren't they? Air support? Hey, we gotta get this stuff to London, but fast. Hey. Send it out with the two RAF cricketers. Sure, use the emergency tunnel. No, no, there's too much German activity near the, near the, uh... No, no, there's too much uh, German activity near the tunnel entrances. Exits. No, that's wrong. <laughs> Hold on a minute now, look. We didn't mean to scare you. My name's John Pendleton. This is my son. My <laughs> name is not John Pendleton. <laughs> Oh, of course, his name was Walton, one of the senior members of that family so popular among viewers who find crossroads an intellectual challenge. I, uh, I, I, actually, I, I hope I haven't shattered too many illusions, revealing that even the Waltons are prone to fouling up occasionally. It feels rather like shooting down Peter Pan. But as with any other actors in long-running series, I'm afraid you have to face it. It happens. It even happens with Grandma and John Boy. You can thank the good Lord we've got that. A lot of folks are doing what? <laughs> Mary Ellen, have you gone crazy? Let him down! Why did he come up here? Well, that's no reason to hang him by his balls from a Christmas tree. <laughs> to hang him by the Christmas... <laughs> Isn't it strange? Isn't it strange how how disconcerting that was, coming from him? It? It, it's it's somehow like like seeing Father Christmas eating venison, you know? or or hearing a weeping willow giggle. As a matter of fact, though, giggling is is more or less what corpsing means. You see, the finances of movie making are such that shooting any kind of film can only be compared to Ronnie Corbett dancing with Raquel Welsh. The overheads are fantastic. So, so because of the, the tension that this brings to every filming session, your nerves start bunching up, and as a consequence, some completely innocent phrase can suddenly hit you on the funny bone. And next thing you know, any mention of it sends you off into a fit of giggles that absolutely no threat or pleading can make you control. I, I, I don't know if you ever noticed, but it happens to quite a lot of people at funerals. <laughs> well, maybe that's why they call it corpsing. <laughs> Any, anyway, in, in watching this selection of some of the film and television sequences that it's called a halt to, notice how Peter Sellers stands out as one of the great gigglers of contemporary cinema. The leader has been identified as Jean Tournier. How much did they get? A million. Here's the report. <laughs> the leader has been identified.
identified as Jean Tournier. How much did they get? A million. Here's the report. Oh. oh, that's a big old that is. 45% of the population of blood group O. Oh. Why couldn't it be AB rhesus negative for a change? Yeah, but there was a bit of feather found in the pocket. Fair enough. Exactly the same as those. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say, by and large, that we're better off with or without fairies? <laughs> Doctor, there's that strange music again. It seems to have stopped the big fellow in his tracks. That music. That quaint. <laughs> Did you say? <laughs> this is a doll. Ah, uh, yes, uh, that is a doll. Yes, I know that. I know that. It's not that. So. <laughs> oh, this did. <laughs> <laughs> I might have thought that you could possibly have had a much smaller one and had just as much entertainment. I'm <laughs> <laughs> in in my younger days at the police academy. I used to be quite an athlete, you know. My speciality at the bows. They used to call me... <laughs> Would you give me a hand with these bags? Certainly. You take the blonde and I'll take the one in the table. <laughs> Stop that! Master. nearly come to end of part one, or as the caption will probably read on this program, end of Pratt one. So <laughs> let me just say that in Pratt two, we'll be moving from purely verbal disasters to look at some of the more environmental cock-ups that afflict filmmakers, because as another distinguished American wrote, it is better to slip with foot than tongue. So bearing that in mind, we'll leave you with yet one more distinguished American. That's great. Thank you. I want that autograph. And it has the autograph and, so, and just put... I say, oh, yeah, I see it's on there. And nice. incidentally, the vice president has one of his balls for you, oh. too. Welcome back to another chorus of bloopers, bungles, and bleeps. <laughs> Further evidence that the thrilling celebrities you see on your cinema and television screens are not only just as human as you or I, they are also just as fallible. Oh, are they fallible. <laughs> you understand, Lieutenant, there's an article of war covering your conduct. Sir, but... Not another word. I'll call headquarters. Give me headquarters. <laughs> Nowadays, they use the phone the other way around. <laughs> 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 <It's funny. laughs> well, that is a surprise. Come on up, John, and we'll have a wee drink for you to wet your whistle. Every prospect pleases. 
This is the Guild Hall, the setting for much of that tradition. But that very tradition, which has set the city apart for so long, is, it seems, no longer a defence against change. to see that even film stars sometimes behave like they put their contact lenses in sideways. <laughs> Actually, where, where I found these symptoms of fallibility most comforting was when we went sniffing around current affairs and news programs. Now, <clears throat> I've always been a bit in awe of the people who present current affairs. They all seem to radiate such an air of natural authority when they take their cameras out in the street to buttonhole ordinary members of the public. The faces they shove their microphones into always seem to respond so, so readily, so obediently. It wasn't until we looked through some of the corpses on their cutting room floor, I realised that sometimes the mighty television interviewer doesn't just meet his match. He gets wiped out. <laughs> That's why I like to think of this next selection as Joe Public hits back. <laughs> Tell me why you've decided to stay out this morning. Because that is the official line. Is that your line as well? My line is always the official one. How long can you continue to stay out without being paid? How long can I continue? Isn't that a personal question? Well, possibly it is, but it well, might... Don't might, ask personal might, questions. It might be a question to gauge just how long it, this will Who go might us be? Well, I suppose the rest of the population has got to be interested, haven't they? Are they interested? Well, there's a port standing idle, isn't there? I don't know, is there? Well, there is. So you're one of the people who work here. Am I? How long can you go on? How long can I go on? As long as the official line is that we stop eight. Somebody just said we can go on for 11 days or 11 months. Well, that is their opinion, isn't it? Aren't you suffering any personal hardship? Why do you want to this? know? Let's say we're philanthropic. Are you? <laughs> you must be joking, Skipper. Why is this building particularly important? Cut. I haven't the remotest Cut. idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Lyons, we have to start by asking you the circumstances that bring you here on a Saturday afternoon. Well, to bring me here on a Saturday afternoon is is for this film job. What's <laughs> <laughs> the television? No. Okay. Still going. Right. Excuse me. Can I just have a chat with you for Westwood Diary? Still going. Uh, I'm from Westwood Television. Oh, you are. Yes. <laughs> Just going back to the to its grandness and size and scale and so on, what does it tell you about the times that it was built? You're going to have to cut again because you're right off my subject. <laughs> you haven't seen her yet? No. But she is coming to see her? Norwich. Oh. She come home to Norwich. That's where she lives. Hmm. Well, jolly good luck to you, uh, Ted. I hope you have many more years. I'll tell you something else. You won't put that in. Because I had a man come down to see me at my wedding anniversary. And of course there was a piece in the door and fake times you see it my photo. Yeah. Did you? Yes. Oh. Well I told him a bit to put in there. I said, bear in mind I said I'd six children and I was teaming then, only an ordinary teaming. I got fifteen children a week and I had six children to keep besides me and my wife. I said, and I didn't go down to the post office to get family loans. He said, I must put that in. Why not? Oh, well, that's very interesting. <laughs> there you are. You've got to put the bagger in. 
Come from yes, I come from doing? Washington, D.C. Actually, you overlapped my work. I'm sorry. Thank you. No. I have a high metabolic rate and I speak quickly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, how, ma how many Strabane people are employed in the factory? Well, not very many. What's as far as I know, anyway. <laughs> my, my wife is, is, is employed, but I'm not, I'm not employed. And there's a consulate, if you say there's trying to hold, it doesn't give the. Sorry, you're, yes. you're, you're moving around. Yes. Yes. Constable Mr. Ban. Keep your voice down because the microphone will take it. Yes. Just as you're talking to me now. We've got a Constable Mr. Ban. You're blasting the microphone. You see? Yes. The microphone can get you all right. We've got a Constable Mr. Ban that doesn't give the people who's born in the town. They don't give out the houses to the people who's born in the town. I've been through it several times in the town. I had to go to the minister's door. Yes. Just a moment. And there's only four. Yes. There's only four Mr. Ban. And they're supposed to get 13 stamps. And the, the rich peers are saying that the, 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 the one is going up every year. The people are born to the banner and take to get the leaf work. When they have to cross the water, they keep few homes. There are three men yes. outside the town hall. Yes, sir. Yes, three men. There's only one George Cunningham. A few hundred people around at the Liberal Exchange. You, yes. don't, you don't seem to be getting much support. Yes, the Liberal Exchange sends, sends the men across the water and border in the town, but they don't send them up to jail work. And this fact, they lay for two years. The people had to go up and sign on the daughter line on, on Stavan soil. Remember that fact, the expulsion of Stavan soil belongs to Stavan people. When you love Mr. Stavan, you're born Mr. Ban. If you're baptized Mr. Ban, seven, you're born Mr. Ban. If you're not born Mr. Ban or baptized, you don't belong to the town. You're just a <laughs> <laughs> but of course it's a very grand piece of architecture. I mean, is that of some historical significance? You've got me again, I'm afraid. I'm, not... I'm a tramway engineer. <laughs> Don't put that bit in. <laughs> Current affairs once more hitting the nail squarely on the thumb. But what, what all those bits of film had, had in common, though, was that each one founded on recalcitrant people. But equally frequent are the don't put that ins, which are caused by recalcitrant things, what someone once called the innate hostility of inanimate objects. <laughs> well, around film studios, any kind of thing that you handle is called a prop. And if you'd always believed the word prop meant something that holds everything up, <laughs> how right you were. <laughs> Oh. Oh. <laughs> Here's a piece of wire wool, not something you'd normally expect to burn. <laughs> Sixteen years ago, that's true, isn't it? 
It's true, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes. <laughs> this isn't really a visiting day, but they said you could come back. Uh, or you can leave those if you like. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> Morning, you lots of gas. Ice on your wings. It's not so good, Sonny. Not so good. Don't lose your head. Remember what you've been taught. Because when you think about it, that line of his more or less sums up what practically every modern television playwright seems to be trying to say. Are you in the jail? I got a message for you. <laughs> but while we're on today's television drama, it's worth noticing how some of the technology that surrounds it has introduced entirely new ways of putting the mockers on the acting profession. Do you remember that highly emotional dramatic series called Another Bouquet? Well, while the opening of one of its episodes was being transmitted, somewhere up in the television control command module, a switch which should have been on off was somehow for a rather splendid few seconds left in the on position. There's a great evening of entertainment this Saturday on London Weekend at 5.15. On the Muppet Show, we're going to have fantastic musical comedy plus the incredible Mr. Bruce Forsyth. Oh, we ain't got a barrel of money. Great fresh family entertainment on the Muppet Show. You did it for revenge. Apparently, the chances of an accident like that happening are about a million to one against. Which is a pity, isn't it? <laughs> Mind you, when I say a million to one, well, there are places around the network where actually you can get shorter odds. <laughs> Later tomorrow evening, there's drama from Stone Park Women's Prison when the inmates start a campaign of violence. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> well, 
within these walls tomorrow is a story of Stone Park Prison, the women's prison, in which there's not only women's lib, but there's a lot of danger and a lot of bother. Um, I'm quite sure that uh, when the governor, there, you can see her, she's going to be rather cross. We're sorry about the mistake there. We're going to show you a bit of the threatened violence that happens tomorrow. And the story is quite exciting. I bet it wasn't nearly as exciting as what went on next morning in the program control. <laughs> but let's stay with that category of cock-up, which I, I, I suppose you could classify under things that shouldn't happen but do. Because during the filming of a scene, one of the many things that shouldn't happen but do is an actor's concentration being disrupted by an unexpected off-stage noise, a, a telephone ringing, a light bulb exploding, or even, as in the case of the f first example in this sequence, a horse apparently blowing its nose. <laughs> uh, incidentally, just in case you drive yourself mad trying to put a name to this first face, it's Richard Boone. Remember, have gun, will travel. And if you can recall how ravaged he used to look at the best of times, well, just look what happens to him at the worst of times. <laughs> and your faith is beautiful. But sometimes the essence of beauty is a <laughs> Bugbear is not a good place to test it. Are you afraid of a test? Oh, sh <laughs> Dead and buried beneath the sea. Monkey wrench. <laughs> You've been avoiding me all day. Who <laughs> has? Who has? Kings of Rage. That's Hoyle. <laughs> Sir, as soon as possible. <laughs> Just whether that nation or any nation. So conceived! Jesus! Wow! Oh! <laughs> you can't help, shut up. Charlie, I think I can help. Here. whether any central idea unites this colony and other hippie colonies in other cities. Whether they have anything to tell us. Why there is so much emphasis on the use of the drug LSD. <laughs> Come on. How many zeros do you want me to shoot down for you? Oh, I know you're good. There's no need to be reckless. You know, there are safety rules even in your business. What I mean, Jimmy, darling, is I don't want you to take any unnecessary chances. I mean, you've got to come back to me, Jimmy. I can't get this damn lighter to work. And the long night wore on. <clears throat> but that's one of the facts of life about television comedy. And whenever it comes to this matter of making a virtue out of a limitation, well, I would always point to one man who, if everything did go smoothly, would hardly have an act at all. Uh, what was the drink again? I'd like a scotch and ginger. A scotch and ginger, yes. I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> it's a joke for later on. <laughs> Chippy? <laughs> You'll have a wooden leg when after it's ready. And suddenly everybody's goofs fall into a different perspective. 
So, before the basic joke of this program wears out, or my Valium wears off, this <laughs> is where we leave it, with just a few regrets for some of the pieces we weren't able to show. I was dying to find a clip of the star of one of those full frontal nudity lovemaking scenes doing his eighth retake. <laughs> But let me just add two more observations. First, that despite what we've seen, it practically always does turn out all right on the night, and occasionally better than that. And secondly, that I really must express our gratitude to all those actors who gave us their permission to place their private boo-boos on public exhibition. The thought that I would like to leave in your minds is this. Could you imagine doctors allowing anybody to do that? <laughs> <laughs> or even script writers. <laughs>